Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor, host for episode 55 here. Got a quick bunch of quick news stories, some updates. Uh, let's get right into it on this uh, episode. First story, just a quick update at EV sales locally here in Canada. Uh, got an article reporting that the first quarter sales for 2019 have dropped in Ontario specifically. No surprise, since we lost our generous rebate program last year due to the change in government provincially. So it's uh, not uh, that big of a surprise that sales have dropped 54% here in Ontario. However, nationally they are up, and that's a good sign. And I think that has to do both with, um, they're up 21%, and that has to do both with a national incentive that started uh, this year. Now, mind you, these numbers don't reflect that. These are first quarter of this year. So obviously some of the other provinces have been carrying the weight for for uh, EV adoption sales here in Canada, specifically Quebec and BC, British Columbia. And here's a number, here's a chart as far as the numbers go. You'll see that Ontario is the only province that's in the negative. And a Ford Nation, that's all I can say, right? Uh, hopefully the national incentive that started May 1st, we will see that impact here in Ontario. I am, I am hearing very positive feedbacks from a number of dealers um, saying that EV um, uh, at least uh, interest attraction and sales are on the upswing here in Ontario, so that's good to see. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. The top selling models this quarter in Canada, first quarter in Canada, include the Model 3, the Hyundai Kona EV, and the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. So I'll keep my eye on Ontario Canadian sales, but uh, the general news is that it's on an upswing. Ontario was on a downswing, and let's see if we can write that ship and turn around. Always like to follow transit. I mentioned uh, in another show about some recent bus uh, sales and British Columbia is also uh, doing the same thing with electrifying their transit. BC Transit is looking to make their entire fleet of buses fully electric over the next two decades. Um, the plan includes replacing more than 1,200 of their existing buses and adding another 350 over the next 10 years. So uh, over 1,500 units over the next 10 years and globally or with their goal to have uh, all their entire a fleet of buses electric by 2040, which is only 20 years, not that far away. Uh, this uh, is spurring, so this adoption is being spurred because of the federal government and the BC uh, province have pledged uh, just about $80 million in funding to help with this. And the first of the 10 heavy duty electric buses will hit the streets of Victoria starting in 2021. So, residents out there, be on the lookout for all electric buses. And if you happen to see one testing, grab a picture and send it to me. I'd like to hear your thoughts. All right, let me talk about some car manufacturers, and I'll see if I can do this in a couple of minutes and keep it fairly lean today for the show. MG Motors. So I talked about the ZS EV in the last uh, episode or two. It's doing very well. In fact, it smashed MG's previous car sales records by securing a thousand orders in just two weeks. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot when you compare that to the Model 3 as an example. However, for MG, this has not happened before. This is new for them, so I'm glad to see it smashing their records. Unprecedented demand, they're calling. In fact, they've extended their uh, matching of the government grant program for 3,500 pounds for the next 1,000 customers. So if you didn't get into the first 1,000, put your reservations in now and you'll get into that uh, second 1,000 and still uh, get that low launch pricing starting at 21,495 pounds. You can do the math in your own currencies. Great to see that that's continuing and I'm glad that they're doing very well. As I said, I think it's a it's just a smashing vehicle uh, that's gonna hit the, both the, the necessary range and attributes of an all electric vehicle and at a very affordable price. Staying with automotive manufacturers, Porsche, the Taycan. Now that's going to be coming up in news again. There's an official launch coming up uh, later this month or into September. But pre-orders for that have soared, soared over 30,000 units for that. And that um, could be their top-selling Porsche, uh, Porsche as they think it is. Um, they went from 20,000 a few months ago to over 30,000, which is actually more than the ID3 did uh, when uh, Volkswagen initially launched that. So it's interesting to see. Uh, you know, people complain. I complain that people don't, that there's not a lot of money floating around to buy EVs. However, <laughs> luxury EV cars are still continuing to be purchased. So there's obviously people with money and there's at least 30,000 that have put money down on this uh, Taycan. The unveiling will be September 4th. So stay tuned for that. 
Updates on VW with the ID Cross, which is scheduled to be a North American variant of a smaller SUV crossover. I don't know why they keep using those terms, but it is out now in pre-production form in camel gear uh, and some spy shots that uh, people have taken as it's out on the road being road tested. Should enter production in late next year or early 2021, so at least some time away being produced in Emden, Germany plant. And uh, again, it'll be shipping primarily just to the North American marketplaces. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, that will be VW's, it looks like, appears to be their first entry from an all-electric vehicle from a ground up on the ID platforms into North America through the, the Cross model. So, cool pictures. Hopefully, we'll get to see some more renderings. But my understanding, again, when I did the auto show coverage early this year, is that what we saw unveiled is going to be pretty close to the production model. Well, for those slamming Audi and not liking the Quattro, I did a show a couple of shows ago with uh, with a guest that has one who's driving it across Canada. Fantastic machine. Well, certainly Audi wants to do more of that. So they've launched uh, and announced an entry-level version of the e-tron called the e-tron 50 Quattro instead of the 55 Quattro, which is the current e-tron is. It's a smaller package with a 71 kilowatt hour battery pack, and it'll have a range WLTP of about 186 miles, 299 kilometers. So EPA, probably closer to 160 150 to 160 range we'll have to wait and see you can do the math on that it is a, will be a dual motor a configuration all-wheel drive uh, capable of about 230 kilowatts of power and charging capacity up to 120 kilowatts uh, this is going to be an entry-level e-tron sold in europe and they'll start coming in uh, the fourth quarter of this year according to audi which is pretty exciting uh, that's pretty aggressive in the uk um, sales will start in early 2020, and uh, we're not sure about U.S., whether it's going to hit uh, North American and U.S. shores uh, either. Other spec, 0 to 100, six, 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour in 7 seconds. Top speed of 190 kilometers an hour, 118 mph. All-wheel dual motor, as I mentioned, uh, power of uh, 400, 540 excuse me, newton, meter, newton meters of power. DC fast charging 30 minutes up to 120, and uh, it'll have a 2.3 kilowatt single phase to 11 kilowatt three phase for onboard AC charging for level one, level two. So, uh, beautiful looking vehicle. Again, I love the the Quattro 55. So I think the 50 being a little smaller will will again just add more excitement to that already really hot compact SUV market. And finally, my auto roundup: the Mercedes EQS. There's a new model of Mercedes in town, or at least coming. Some spy shots that you're seeing here of that that's floating around. I don't know where these are taken. I'm guessing in Germany somewhere. Um, not much info on the specs. This is something new that Mercedes is kicking around. So it's going to be their second all-electric model after the EQC. And it's going to be a more practical five-door uh, hatchback. Looking at the design, again, they try to hide a lot of specs in these camo gears. Uh, it does look like to be a pure electric vehicle and no other specs given at this time. But, you know, I'm sure based on that platform, they'll be able to get a decent battery pack. But uh, again, you know, just nice to see now we're seeing the, the legacy automakers starting to invest more into electrification and get more serious about it. So it's great to see more choice, more product that's going to be coming out. Oh, exciting. 2020 is going to be interesting. And a quick update to the Nissan BMS update uh, that uh, Nissan launched or announced that they will do for North America. I got a couple of emails and messages for the folks that have had that done, and they said there have been no issues so far. It was a pretty clean install. They were not asked to sign any waivers, which is good news. And what I mean by that is any warranty limitation waivers by getting the upgrade done, the BMS update done. So have to, I'll have to wait and see for mine. And mine's scheduled to, be, to happen sometime this month in August, just waiting for the dealer to get the parts for the uh, ground plate recall or the ground plate service advisory complimentary service that they've got out there for that and then I'll get my BMS update done at the same time but uh, certainly from a few reports that I've received so far everything is looking good. All right, and finally, just uh, I'm going to step up on the soapbox a little bit and just uh, uh, give you some comments about uh, the comments that I see in emails and get on YouTube. It's been just great. As I mentioned in every show, I certainly enjoy the interaction and the feedback that I get from a lot of folks. Some of it not so great. Most of it pretty good, so I'm happy with that. But again, I don't mind all the comments. Just got to keep it clean. But, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about me and my show and what, what how I see, again, the EV landscape shaping out here, where I'm coming from in doing what I do here. 
here. Um, so, you know, it's great to see passion from a lot of people, but, you know, I do see arguments. Well, this model is better than that. And this, you know, this sucks and that's no good. And, you know, guys that drive pickups and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, let me just, I think we're all after the same goal. So, you know, my difference really from some other YouTubers and journalists is that I don't sugarcoat things. I try to report the real, the real life stuff. And, you know, some people think I'm pretty hard on Tesla. Um, but, you know, I just try to deal with the reality of situations. Uh, you know, I'm glad that their sales are going great, but they still have quality issues. Even today, I was reading an article about that, but that's another story. Um, I believe in the EV revolution and the tsunami that has already occurred. And I believe strongly that this move movement is going to go nowhere but up. It's going to continue to grow at a fast pace and, and fast as far as the movement goes but relatively slow when you look at the big picture. What I mean by that is, you know, some analysts and predictors are stating the end of ICE vehicles by 2030 in, in like 10, 10 years or so. I think that's total nonsense. And you got to look at, you know, it's wishful thinking and I, I would love to see it happen. But you got to look at some context there. You know, we have over a century of ICE V heritage and use and in our blood and bones, you know, I mean, that's all I've grown up with. That's all, you know, my parents grew up with and so forth. You know, it goes back a long way. And as a human race, it simply doesn't just go away because something new, shiny and better for us comes out, especially within a short amount of time. You know, beyond the reluctance for change, that is our general behavior as a populace, real world factors will steer EV adoption path. Factors like higher costs still of EVs, relatively small charging infrastructures, at least perceived. Again, I've talked about, uh, did some numbers in a show last year about that. Urban density use cases um, and lack of charging capabilities for people in big cities, you know, live in condos and townhomes and, and uh, cooperative developments and so forth. The convenience in refueling, right, you know, for long distance driving needs. We know you can go pump gas in five minutes and hit the road if you really want to, you know, if you've got a case of got, got to get their itis. But uh, and EVs don't don't work that way. Regional and political socioeconomics is a big, big factor, right? How governments, how economies, how, you know, just country infrastructures can handle that and still a lack of EV choice, a true EV choice to cover all the use cases. So these things are all covered by ICE vehicles today, right? Because they've been around for a hundred and something years and we've grown up, we've been able to, you, you can buy a, an internal combustion vehicle for any use case that you have today and it will work. So to radically pivot to a better form of consumer-based transportation is a nice idea, but in reality, it takes time. Even though some regions and cities may be banning sales of new ICE EVs, EVs, ICE EVs, excuse me, in years to come, the, this is still a small comparison to the global marketplace. And now, I am one that really hopes that EV, the EV adoption shift will happen a lot faster. Believe me, I really want it to, right? We need, we need it for so many reasons. However, the real world factors have a bearing on transformation, and we need to recognize these factors and take strides to change them one by one. This is what is happening now, I believe, in my opinion. Little by little, the ice fee iceberg is being chipped away by this EV paradigm shift. Little by little. More automotive manufacturers getting into the game. More national and regional government support uh, for EV adoption via legislations and programs and incentives and all sorts of stuff. More economies of scale in EV supply chain to help drive affordability and availability, which is critical to increase adoption. And in my opinion, the biggest ice pick, more consumer awareness and education to provide informed choices and decisions for electric vehicles. So while all we might all debate, you know, the general merits of ice fees versus EVs and one brand of EVs versus another, we'll talk about Total cost of ownership and return on the investment of EVs versus ICE fees. You can do some nice math there. The driving capabilities and characteristics of EVs versus internal combustion cars in both different geographies and in climates, and the list goes on. There's a lot of comparisons that we can do. I wrote this down, folks, so that I could read it properly. I believe the main takeaway here is that the EV revolution has started, and there is no stopping it now. Whether you believe it or not, it is happening, and it is not a question of if, but of when, where, and at what scale over time. This is the message that I try to bring to viewers like yourselves that are interested for your own reasons in looking at the EV landscape, to continue informing and providing a real-world perspective on the movement that will change our world, I believe, forever, educating minds one tailpipe at a time. That's what I'm all about. 
And that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 55. I hope you found those thoughts interesting. Thank you very much for watching as always and for uh, you know YouTube comments continue. If you haven't subscribed, please do. That's always important. Keep commenting, keep sending me information. My contact information will be coming up at the end of the show. You can wait for that to scroll by. If you are a Patreon su supporter, again, I'm always, always humbled by Patreon supporters. Thank you very much. If you don't know what it is, check out my Patreon website. If you'd like to help me continue to do these shows, I would encourage you to to help me by uh, providing a donation of a, even a dollar a month can go a long way. Now I have had some people ask me about just one-time donations and unfortunately Patreon doesn't do that. But if you wanted to send me something via PayPal, I can send you my contact information that way and you can do that if you'd like to. I wouldn't say no to any help that somebody wants to provide. Just send me an email and I'll get back to you on that. So again, thank you for the Patreon supporters and thank you, my viewer audience, for watching and for being engaged in this great revolution that I try to report on as much as I can, time limited, as I am a one-man band doing this show. So thank you very much again for tuning in. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the EV Revolution Show. And until the next show, please everybody stay safe and I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.